Henry, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, first one, I would like to uh, also want to uh, thank the organizer, particularly with G, uh, for the opportunity to be here. It's been a great meeting and a uh, lot of outstanding talk that I have learning uh, a great deal so far. And uh, in this talk, uh, I would like to just uh, highlight some uh, progress in uh, soybean genome sequencing and uh, some accomplishment in uh, a molecular breeding and uh, a bit about uh, what we do uh, currently with uh, some resequencing project and uh, uh, perspective about soybean. A little bit of introduction about uh, soybean uh, as the major legume crop. Uh, and like I said, we'll discuss uh, uh, some uh, progress in soybean genome sequencing, uh, example of market system selection, and uh, some future uh, perspective. You've seen this slide from uh, Doug Cook earlier. Uh, this is uh, put, put into contact. Uh, this is where soybean fit in that uh, closely related to P and P uh, at the legumes. So a lot of uh, things that we can uh, learn in terms of uh, doing compared to the genomic and, uh, and this, this part of my uh, uh, motivation for working with Rajiv and uh, people are equally sad to, uh, to do more of uh, compared to the genomic among uh, legumes and, and also learning how they adapt to different uh, stress conditions. Uh, so I mean obviously the major uh, legume uh, oil seed crop uh, but in the, uh, it have a lot of uh, basically grown uh, uh, over uh, uh, 125 or so million hectare globally, uh, but in the context of the uh, international uh, uh, center activity, uh, soybean is not considered a the global mandate uh, food security crop species. So oftentimes, uh, I, I used to work on rice and uh, sorghum and uh, so forth and so on. Met a lot of my own friend here. In that context, you know, oftentimes I feel like uh, soybean is absolutely like the orphan crop uh, you know, within the international community. So really for me, it was special, uh, very pleased and very much honored to be at this meeting and uh, uh, to speak a little bit more about soybean. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, uh, the U.S. and uh, South America, uh, Brazil specifically and Argentina, are the top three countries in terms of soybean production. And then China, uh, and next to it, basically India. And uh, I will actually uh, talk to several people here. And uh, and uh, surprisingly, most uh, most uh, uh, colleagues that I talk here not even uh, know how much uh, significant really soybean for for India. Uh, in India, the, on an annual basis, uh, basically uh, uh, India grows about uh, uh, billion number five globally. India grow about 10 to 11 million hectares of soybean every year. Uh, China is basically just slightly above that, about 11, 12 million hectares. And the U.S. and Brazil typically about 35 million hectares of soybean in terms of the acre of production. So, uh, so soybean, in fact, is a significant crop in, in India. Uh, so hopefully there will be opportunity for uh, uh, international collaboration from that standpoint, uh, you know, be in the important legumes and uh, into the future because it does provide uh, pretty much uh, good supply of uh, cooking oil and a uh, good source of protein, very, uh, very well balanced in terms of amino acid. And of course, because of that, soybean is being utilized very heavily in animal feed uh, globally. But also, you a you know bio uh, bio biodiesel in uh, uh, different different country. Uh, so uh, so it is in fact a an important crop uh, in the context of uh, uh, global food production and also uh, cooking oil. And of course, uh, just a bit of uh, of the history here. I uh, you know all the talk is just amazing. You know what been accomplished in the last uh, five years of course, in the last ten years. And uh, I prepared for this talk, I went back to some of the early genetic uh, map. Uh, I actually joined in the soybean community about 10 years ago. I used to work on rice and sorghum uh, before I moved to University of Missouri. So uh, 
Uh, so, you know, back in the 1990s, you can see the, uh, the genetic map, uh, you know, uh, with uh, restriction fragment photomorphism. We don't hear anybody talk about that anymore here, but that's that how it started. And then it moved along and it took, uh, you know, a decade or so to get uh, more to microsatellite and then SNP. Uh, SNP come along really, uh, this, this is one of the uh, publications in genetic in 2010. And then uh, years or so uh, after, I, uh, after that, I published that uh, paper that basically integrated a lot of uh, microsatellite and uh, SNP uh, that, at that time from uh, the uh, uh, Illumina SNP array uh, platform. But since then, we came a long way. Uh, the soybean genome uh, with the consortium uh, uh, in the U.S. and uh, several uh, you know, international uh, collab uh, collaborators that uh, basically uh, uh, put together this, uh, this uh, uh, reference genome uh, were published in 2010. And we're now in the second uh, assembly uh, version, if you're interested in that. And so this is clearly the milestone for the soybean research community uh, in terms of getting into uh, the modern uh, genomic and, 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 uh, and molecular breeding. And then not uh, uh, long after that, uh, basically, uh, uh, the community very much uh, with the leadership of uh, Perry Cregan uh, developed this uh, soy uh, soybean SNP array with the Lumina uh, 50,000, the 50K SNP array. Uh, at the platform for uh, genotyping of soybean. And, uh, and soybean actually enjoy the, uh, uh, the benefit of uh, uh, basically we have this uh, SNP array and we're able to uh, genotype the entire USDA collection uh, with uh, nearly 19,000 accessions. So that gives us uh, a lot of information in terms of, you know, try to understand the, the diversity within, within uh, the species and also uh, it allow a number of uh, different, different laboratories able to do GWAS at that resolution. And 50,000 SNP is still uh, substantially more than what we normally have, not normally do. And uh, so that, that, that is the, and then for now we have the uh, 9,000, uh, uh, 6,000 SNP array uh, basically also uh, being utilized for, uh, uh, you know, primary QTL mapping in different, different groups because the cost is more affordable in terms of uh, uh, handling uh, a number of recombinant live population and it still generate, you know, uh, easily two, three thousand marker on a genetic map, uh, you know, within ten days or so. So it, it, it you know, clearly a uh, big step compared to what, where, where we've been before. And so there uh, have been a number of, uh, you know, QDL mapping uh, work been done and I'm just trying to highlight uh, for you here, uh, you know, some some of the work that we do at the University of Missouri and, and also highlight some, some other work uh, related to, to soybean. I am, with the interest of time, I can only highlight a few things here. If I, what we learn and able to apply uh, the uh, uh, molecular marker into the uh, practical breeding program. So, uh, so I try to give example on, uh, you know, certain disease resistant and uh, about of stress and also uh, seed composition. So it give you an idea on different things that we try to improve uh, for in soybean, uh, particularly in the U.S. and I think that they have some implication uh, uh, at the international level as well. So in the U.S., uh, when we think about biotic stress, uh, it really comes down to uh, a nematode known as soybean cyst nematode. It's the most uh, important pest. Uh, and it's uh, causing an annual loss of exceeding a billion dollar to the U.S. The producer. Uh, so again, this is the number one uh, uh, pathogen that we had to, we had to work on. Uh, has, there, it, uh, there has been a rather limited number of uh, exotic plant introduction that basically provide uh, uh, resistance. Uh, they come down to a couple of plant introduction. Uh, here, uh, one of them is PI-88, 788. It uh, had been mapped earlier to carry a major QTL uh, known as IG one Another soft uh, also utilized to some extent is basically peaking. Uh, it uh, been known to have a couple of QTL uh, that confer the, uh, confer the resistance. And uh, of course it took uh, uh, people a long time uh, uh, to try to find, you know, try to clone the, the, the resistant gene. 
And of course, with the availability of the soybean genome, I think that the Saturday, that, that uh, fire mapping and cloning uh, uh, shortly after the availability of, 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 of the soybean genome, uh, the weapon genome. There's a couple leading works that basically uh, published. Uh, one is the work by uh, Dr. Andrew Ben at University of Wisconsin. Uh, he, his group, he basically cloning uh, the IG1 uh, gene, uh, QTL. And actually now we learn that, that it, it's a very unique uh, QTL that actually a cluster of uh, two different genes. And it has a couple number of variation. And uh, probably the reason why, even though it's a major, quote unquote, major QTL, uh, known for a long time, uh, but it's uh, very, very, uh, still very durable, very stable in terms of the resistance. And I think that, and after we learn about that uh, QTL, it actually has three different genes, and like I said, with copy number variation. And so the copy number actually correlates very well with the level of resistance. Uh, you can have you know, anything, obviously, from no copy to uh, up to 10 copies in that cluster. And uh, so this, this was published, again, not long ago. And then uh, uh, pretty much about the same time, uh, the group at the University of Missouri actually cloning the, the, other, the other QTL, known as IHG1. And it turned out that QTL is actually a, just a single gene. And so, uh, and, uh, so that uh, with those, of course, now we can pretty much uh, you know, use the gene uh, pretty much for marker assisted selection we can develop. SNP assays and it worked uh, very, very effectively, very, very nicely. And uh, so those are uh, considered to be, you know, among the significant discovery in uh, soybean uh, biology uh, that uh, uh, soybean system adult uh, resistant. And uh, with the availability of that uh, 50,000 SNP uh, uh, genotype inf genotypic information, uh, we and and also other group, we basically conduct a number of GWAS study. And uh, this, is, this, is a, this is an example of the work that we did on, again, on uh, soybean system adult resistance. And of course, it uh, picked up pretty much the, the known, uh, the known uh, uh, QTL, the known low side. And we also picked up a new low side that had been known uh, through biparental mapping over the years. Uh, so the GWAS pretty much uh, picked up that, that uh, new uh, uh, loci at the new source of resistance. And, uh, and uh, uh, we, in the process, have tried to find map that uh, uh, QTL, and hopefully we can see what would be the new source of resistance. And of course, with, uh, with those type of information today and with the, the known uh, gene and also the uh, uh, number of SNP that we have uh, uh, for, the, for the entire USDA collection, we can actually construct uh, the phylogenetic uh, to look at the distribution of uh, clustering of different, different sorts of resistance and uh, haplotype. So we pretty much uh, precisely now can basically put together you know, any, any particular combination of uh, uh, re uh, sorts of resistance and have the molecular marker that uh, will support the, uh, the breeding and the genotyping for the selection. So really just a, a very powerful tool to be able to, to do uh, this type of, uh, you know, basically specific allele mining and uh, track the specific uh, resource of resistance uh, very, very quickly uh, uh, compared to what we, uh, what we were not able to do, you know, let's say five years ago. And uh, this is another nematode resistance uh, that uh, we basically uh, uh, Pretty much apply perhaps what day Ed was we're talking today in terms of scheme uh, genotype by sequencing. I discussed quite a bit with Ed Butler at the time, and you know, and he basically said, well, you know, he thought the soybean genome is small enough that we can try this, you know, whole genome sequencing and scheme genotyping sequencing and see how it works. So we have the population uh, recombinant population up uh, close to uh, 250 lines. And it pretty well characterized, and you know, we 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 done the the, the, the QTL mapping work earlier with the low resolution SNP uh, chip, and 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 quite have pretty robust uh, phenotypic data. So we basically seek on the parental line at about 10x the equivalent, uh, and then seek on the progeny uh, uh, roughly about 0.19 equivalent. And it certainly worked uh, pretty well because of the good reference genome. Uh, this is the collaboration with BGI at the time. 
uh, so we can structure that green map and uh, you know even a very stringent uh, uh, criteria you know we still have easily have you know a few hundred thousand markers, a hundred thousand marker that we can put on the beans uh, and construct the bean map and it very much uh, pinpoint to the same QTL that we uh, we map earlier with the lower resolution uh, genetic map uh, the major QTL controlling this and from that pretty quickly that we narrow down to a couple gene uh, that uh, that uh, can uh, that uh, that would be the uh, the candidate for the resistant for we doing functional characterization now with you know uh, uh, transgenic approach just to just to just to uh, confirm uh, the gene uh, but uh, of course uh, uh, now we have uh, pretty much uh, gene based marker that we can develop SNP for the uh, uh, molecular breeding so so this is an example that you, know, you can have the population and able to you uh, pretty much the scheme. Uh, genotype by sequencing and zoom into a, a QTL with a candidate gene fairly, fairly quickly. And uh, about the same time, uh, this is the work uh, by Professor Hong Ming Lam in China and Hong Kong. And he's work on sound tolerance. And uh, basically, there's a wild soybean uh, soldier that have uh, sound tolerance and the cultivated soybean in not. And so uh, he basically, uh, and it's uh, been known to be a major gene, uh, QTL been, been mapped uh, for, for, for uh, a few years. And he pretty much did the same thing with, uh, with, with the uh, genotyping by sequencing uh, whole genome approach. And uh, it basically uh, about uh, 90 or so individual uh, with the major gene. And uh, sequencing about, you know, very, very shallow sequencing, just like what we did. And he put them at pinpoint to a, uh, uh, actually in this case, actually pinpoint to a single gene, because this has been published uh, not long ago. Uh, uh, so pinpoint to the exact the gene, and uh, he did some functional uh, characterization validation, and that uh, this is the sodium transporter gene that uh, responsible for that song tolerance. And again, we can uh, now, you know, uh, uh, use this to uh, to look into the job lysium and able to mine specific allele and specific source of resistance that we can uh, tolerance that we can utilize in the, in in the breeding program. Uh, so uh, so so I've made a few examples that uh, you can you can uh, pinpoint uh, uh, basically gene and QTL fairly quickly and develop molecular marker that have uh, utility very much directly into the breeding program. Uh, this is also a major success story. This, this is the story in the soy, U.S. soybean industry for 20 years. Uh, that uh, the community uh, and the producer uh, uh, basically uh, try to uh, uh, improve the, uh, the content of uh, oleic acid in soybean. Okay, this is the typical profile of fatty acid in soybean. Uh, five major fatty acid and uh, and uh, and of course, the one that we concern the most is oleic. This is what makes olive oil and canola oil, and you know, have high value. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, 70, 80 percent oleic in those type of oil seed crops. So soybean is not competing very well with the other canola oil and 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 and, and uh, olive oil, of course. Uh, and so, so typically in in, in soybean, uh, the oleic acid content about 23 percent. The goal they try to get it up to 75, 80 percent, and so, and I say the story been a 20-year story because people been looking for a way to do it. Of course, uh, 10 years ago, Tupon, uh, 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 pioneer Tupon, basically just used the transgenic approach. So actually, just silent that one gene, the fat, fat 2A gene, you can achieve uh, the accumulation of of of, of uh, oleic acid. It's been done, and of course they go through all of the regulatory process, and it just been commercialized uh, last uh, last year in the U.S. Uh, with uh, the another uh, transgenic soybean that uh, consistently produced 80 percent uh, oleic acid. In other words, max soybean oil is just as good as oil uh, for different application. Uh, at the University of Missouri, uh, we basically found, uh, and this is one of the rare occasions that we basically, you know, hit the jackpot, basically. Uh, we found the combination of two mutations uh, in the FAT2 uh, gene, uh, FAT21A and FAT21B. And uh, it's rather a simple mutation, so uh, if you combine those two mutant genes uh, through uh, molecular marker, uh, we can achieve pretty much the same. 80 uh, percent uh, oleic acid content. So this is a major breakthrough in terms of the uh, uh, 
uh, discovery from uh, genetic resource to uh, uh, identification of the, uh, of the mutation through genetic analysis and then the application of the molecular marker in uh, the development of the next generation of soybean that have much, much better uh, fatty acid uh, uh, profile. Uh, so of course, you know, with the uh, simple mutation and uh, it have no yield track, uh, it works in just about every genetic background. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it being utilized now across the U.S. in a number of soybean breeding program, I actually coordinating the uh, genotyping uh, activity for the uh, uh, for this uh, market assisted uh, back crossing program that basically uh, produced a variety uh, with high oleic acid content uh, using molecular marker. So we refer to this as a non GMO or high oleic soybean to distinguish from the, the transgenic uh, soybean that just uh, been launched on, on, you know, on the market just uh, last year. And so Everything we I'm talking about earlier, of course, now we can use SNP, uh, you know, genotyping platform in different way. Pretty much, uh, pretty much, uh, what what we've seen from the uh, talk by Mike Thompson uh, from Erie. So we had a number of platforms that we can utilize for different SNP genotyping, uh, and of course, they uh, pretty much, uh, you know, in the uh, medium uh, throughput type of system, uh, a compared to some uh, company. But nevertheless, if we still can handle a large number of samples to accommodate uh, the uh, the breeding program uh, fairly, fairly well. And uh, so just different platform that we, uh, we utilize depend on, uh, uh, depend on the specific situation. Uh, so it did work fairly well uh, in terms of the application of those uh, SNP marker. Uh, so uh, I guess in some way, you know, those are, those are the, uh, uh, those are the easy one because it, 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 it does go now to either major gene or major QTL. And the challenge ahead, there obviously the complex trait. Uh, what can we do in terms of yield improvement? Uh, still the number one breeding objective in any specific uh, breeding program. And the number of uh, physiological components that we'll play into it uh, that we need to understand uh, what, the, what the SNP, what the gene, uh, so far and so on. And then uh, abiotic stress is clearly also the big one for soybean uh, drought. Uh, and uh, high temperature and water logging uh, basically uh, important. Uh, we do have both drought and uh, water logging at the same uh, uh, same uh, location, uh, same years, you know, quite quite often. And uh, seed composition uh, overall, I mean, I think we overcome a major uh, a modification of the fatty acid profile, but uh, certainly the, the 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 oil and the protein content uh, still uh, need to be improved uh, further, and and of course they are more polygenic uh, traits. And uh, a couple other nutritional quality we still need to overcome, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, modification of the sugar uh, composition in soybean to improve uh, digestibility. Uh, uh, so, and uh, we still got, uh, uh, you know, a couple of major fungal, uh, uh, fungal disease that are considered to be uh, more, you know, polygenic uh, than, than a single major gene. So those work I uh, continue on and, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, uh, people in the community and did different labs will come up with uh, uh, more information that we can then utilize more rootedly in, in the breeding program. And uh, uh, speaking about you, uh, and, uh, and overall, uh, you know, soybean basically have, a, um, you know, basically a couple uh, genetic uh, bottleneck uh, that, that, that really reduce the genetic diversity quite substantially. Uh, overall, soybean have the rather narrow genetic base compared to most other crop species. Uh, I guess the first bottleneck is the, the uh, you know, domestication. Uh, that uh, we have a number of uh, land rays from, uh, from, 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 uh, from uh, uh, China that brought to the U.S. actually not long ago, you know, a hundred years ago or so. And, uh, and soybean become a major oil seed crop in the U.S. And, uh, and, and the, breeding, the breeding has been done over the last 75 years or so. And that basically uh, further reduced the, uh, the, the genetic diversity uh, in the elite germanism. And so, uh, of course, now if we come back and try to improve the yield potential in soybean, we need, to, we need to see what can we do to basically overcome that uh, limited genetic diversity. We need to go back to the wild species, you know, land race, in, uh, in, uh, in different Asian uh, countries where soybean evolved. 
And uh, uh, this is just a, a study that uh, by a professor, uh, 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 professor in China uh, just uh, did a uh, sequencing of some selected line and it basically essentially confirmed the fact that uh, uh, you know the selection uh, during the domestication and the breeding selection it basically you know reduced the diversity in soybean and so uh, uh, so those that they just basically confirmed with whole genome seeking data that we can uh, uh, clearly have less diversity in the uh, today elite germ lysium compared to the uh, land race or the wild soybean uh, glycine soja. And so uh, this review is just highlight the need, uh, you know, for uh, possible strategy for using, you know, basically genomic uh, for, uh, you know, overcome the, uh, the, the, the uh, go back to the wild species and try to dissect the diversity. Uh, and uh, since then, there have been uh, several uh, papers talking about, uh, you know, whole genome resequencing in soybean. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, with about five minutes left here, I just basically try to give you a, uh, just a highlight of, uh, of the project that we started uh, about a year ago in the U.S. and that is to uh, do resequencing of uh, uh, very, very much close to a thousand uh, soybean uh, session. And of course those uh, lines were picked out uh, based on 50,000 SNP diversity. So we can pick out a very nice set of lines that representing the most diversity. That we, that, that we can come up with. Uh, so about you know, 800 uh, or so glycine max and about 100 uh, glycine soja can be seeking at 15 next uh, equivalent. And we attempt to, uh, 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 to, to, do, to, have, to do the novel sequencing for a couple more of reference genome, uh, one with glycine max. Uh, we had William 82 uh, representing the northern uh, uh, US soybean germ lasium, and we try to pick another line that representing the southern U.S. Uh, uh, soybean germ lysium base and for the wild soybean. At the same time, uh, there are sequencing effort going on in, 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 in other uh, related project. Uh, I put about working with, with the group here uh, that uh, sequencing the ancestral line and also the, the so-called milestone cultivar that representing the 75, 80 years of soybean breeding in the U.S and try to see what changing how tech plays in terms of the uh, uh, breeding, uh, breeding selection. We also have an M uh, parent, uh, an M population uh, that uh, be in study. Uh, Perry Gregan started this, and Dr. Brian Deere at University of Illinois coordinated this project, look for yield and QTL and so forth and so on. So we have similar kind of uh, genetic structure that we have heard over the last uh, couple of days. And so, uh, so that all together, it add up, and so, uh, um, hopefully uh, by uh, the end of the year, early next year, uh, we basically uh, uh, will be able to release information uh, publicly uh, to the international community with uh, 1,000 or so uh, soybean genome with about 50 next uh, genome equivalent. So that should give us a lot of information to study the genome structure of diversity. And also we can, can do, you know, GWAS and uh, association through the network of people that are working on uh, the phenotypic uh, data collection. Okay, so the reference genome, uh, basically uh, this is the strategy uh, that uh, you heard Dave Edwards talk a little bit about this and so uh, hopefully we can get some uh, maybe uh, uh, collaboration with different people here too in terms of you know, how, how to deal with the assembly of, of uh, the novel sequencing uh, through the combination of uh, Illumina sequencing technology bio and also optical uh, mapping. So all of this are ongoing and we will uh, start to uh, put them together. And uh, this is just a pilot study that we did uh, with about 100 genomes or so that we take a look at uh, the, the data. It does contain some elite lines and also uh, different exotic germ lines. And basically just confirm uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, we lost a lot of diversity in the cultivated uh, soybean uh, compared to the wild soybean. So that really uh, just uh, confirmed that at, at the global uh, whole genome level. Uh, so, uh, and we basically picked out the number of, you know, regions that seem to be associated with domestication and also artificial selection. And hopefully those will help us to basically uh, understanding uh, the, the important uh, QTL and important trade that, uh, that uh, we go forward dissecting 
uh, in different material, either name, population, or by parental population or association mapping. And so, uh, in the interest of time, I think they basically have a, a final slide uh, that sum up. And I bother this from, you know, Raji. He, he had a lot of review article, an always nice diagram, a schematic diagram. It's just indicating the integration of genomic and different uh, 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 selection approach that we can now uh, able to able to utilize and you know any crop species or obviously also soybean. I think I've been mentioned uh, again and again here basically phenotyping is a major bottleneck. It becomes the most uh, you know critical component of, of, of this whole thing uh, to dissect important traits. So uh, really fascinating to see what Pat able to show uh, today in terms of some of the cool robotic and phenomic technology. I think we definitely need to adopt uh, most of those uh, technology as much as much we can to uh, dissect the important traits and soybean particularly yield and able to stress tolerance because phenotyping for those traits in the field would be would be needed and also uh, uh, very very critical and it become a most difficult part. The, the genotyping part is very much very much become easy. Uh, and Last but not least, basically the, the big, big data set, uh, big data era. So we basically have, uh, you know, uh, soy KB uh, in our university to, to help maintain some of the uh, data from uh, genomic data. We work uh, with the iPlan uh, community to, to put all of that uh, soybean information into iPlan. Uh, and uh, last but not least, they are the people uh, that we've been working with, uh, and I just want to recognize them and appreciate their support and BGI and uh, Rajiv and uh, different international collaboration. So uh, maybe the final thought that I would like to say would be that, uh, you know, soybean again is typically not considered to be a, a global uh, mandate crop for food security. But uh, last year, uh, for the first time, I think, in the history that, that, that we can remember, the uh, uh, U.S. AID uh, basically started a soybean innovation lab in Africa. Uh, so the University of Illinois and the University of Missouri very much uh, the lead institution to, uh, to it have several components uh, from, you know, uh, human nutrition to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, production system. And we do have a, a, uh, one of the objectives in um, plant breeding and genetic and hopefully to get uh, Soybean introduced and help uh, different different country in, in Africa and work with IATAs and so forth and so on. So I think that that I think that uh, a time ago I think that will open up some international collaboration for soybean and and hopefully in the long term it will contribute to the overall food security in my opinion. But it is the major <laughs> legume crop. Uh, with that, I thank you very much for your attention and be happy to answer some questions. Okay, thanks, Henry. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, we might just um, have maybe one pressing question, if there is one. Yes, down the front. Quick question, please. Thank you. See, at one time in U.S., they used to do whenever a new variety of soybean is uh, uh, approved, they used to do a lot of experiments with the combination of uh, rhizobium so that uh, you get the best combination of the crop genotype and the rhizobium. I was wondering in the genomic era, is it possible to have, uh, based on the genomic interactions of soya bean as well as uh, the rhizobium, to identify the best restraints? Yes, I think so, yes. Yes, and I think that actually needs to be done. I mean, it pretty much, I think Doug Cook pretty much uh, basically present the, the talk this morning uh, or this afternoon and pretty much show that uh, it's important to to combine the Pacific variety with the Pacific rhizobium in the, in the human soy environment that to optimize the nitrogen fixation because that is obviously one of the big benefits of soybean, the nitrogen fix, fixation capacity. And then you put in the contact of drought stress. Now we need to, you know, nitrogen fixation is very sensitive to drought condition but we know their uh, bacteria strain and also soybean plant are basically more drought tolerant. So we need to optimize that as well. Not, not only the specific interaction for optimum condition, but also under stress condition. If you have acid soy, it could be the different thing. Water stress condition, uh, different situation. So yes, okay, we thanks. need to optimize that as thanks, well. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. I think we need to move on. Thank you very much. Please join in thanking Henry. Thank you. Please talk.